Hey everyone, welcome back. This is Brian, and in this video, we're going to recap all the different ways we can do threading in Qt, and we're going to compare them. We're going to go over the pros and cons of each one. This video may seem redundant, but I want to make sure we have all of these concepts solidified because we are going to give a graphic user interface example using, you guessed it, Qt widgets. This is what Qt is really famous for, is user interfaces, because let's face it, people hate command lines, you know, actual people users want a graphical interface that they can do something with. So we're going to show a very simple example and tie all of the threading conversation into why it is so important, especially when you get into a user interface. Um, spoiler alert, I just want to cover a few things super quick, so bear with me. These videos on YouTube are different than the videos I have out on Udemy. Udemy are full-blown courses, pardon me, and uh, Basically, this specific video is kind of a combination of Q6 core for beginners, uh, intermediate, definitely advanced, and we are sprinkling in a little bit of widgets for beginners. Now, you'll notice that it's Qt 5 widgets, and this is a Qt 6 video. I have not yet re-recorded widgets or QML for Qt 6, but fear not, there's minimal changes. I actually went through thousands of lines of code, and... For the most part, widgets and QML are very backwards compatible with Qt 5, so you can still sign up for those courses and have minimal problems. Also, well, I'm going to record those in the future because it's fall time here, around Halloween, and that means the leaves are beautiful but also falling, and every single one of my neighbors loves their leaf blower. I mean, really loves their leaf blower. That's all I hear for about two weeks straight, so I don't do any professional grade recording in the fall because I'm sorry, you're gonna hear leaf blowers in the background. Tried to remove them, but I can still hear them. So bear with me. Anyways, let's dive and take a look at different threading models and how we can get through this. Okay, because this is a recap video, we're going to start at the very beginning. I'm gonna say new console application. We're gonna do this with our testing. This is gonna be Q6 and this is episode 26. And hit next. I'm going to make sure our build system is CMake because this is a Qt 6 project. Again, doesn't matter. You really could do QMake, but we're going to be using CMake just in the future. And just next, next, make sure you have whatever kit you want as long as it's Qt 6 or higher. And ta da, there is our application in all of its glory. Just going to paste in some notes here. Again, we're testing different ways of threading, pros and cons, and we're going to end this with a graphic user interface example. So first thing we need to do is we need to go in here and we are going to make a class that we're going to work with. And we're going to call this, well, appropriately, worker. You can call it whatever you want, but I'm going to call it worker. Important thing, make sure it's a Q object and it has the Q object macro because we're going to be working with signals and slots. Next, next, finish. And let's pop in here. And we have to do a little bit of surgery on CMake list. So first thing we need to do is actually add the files that we just generated. So I'm going to say worker. And we want the implementation file along with the header file. We're not done yet. Notice how we have core. We're also going to work with concurrent in this video. Remember, Qt concurrent, which I started at the very beginning when we talked about threading, is probably the most simplest yet advanced high level way of doing threading. We're going to cover that in this video, so we have to add it. So we're going to just simply say concurrent. So we're saying core and concurrent are both required, and we're gonna tell CMake to go out and find those. We're gonna do the same thing down here, and we are going to beg, borrow, and steal using copy and paste. And voila, save, and as long as you get this nice, beautiful green bar down there, you're good to go. All of these little issues should clear right up, and if you're super paranoid like me, you can just open up the file and hit build, just to make sure that CMake is functioning properly. Now that we've gotten to this point, well, we can start working on the actual code. So I'm gonna go in here, I'm gonna paste some includes. Again, in case you're wondering how that magically happened, I have notes off the side of the screen here so I could just copy and paste as needed to save a little bit of time. All right, let's go in here. We're gonna say worker, my horrible spelling included at no extra charge. There we go, we're gonna make the deconstructor. Now we have signals. So we're gonna add in the signal called finish. Now remember, we don't implement a signal. This is specifically for Qt. Qt is going to implement that using mock later. So if you right click this and go to refractor, you'll see there's no way to implement it. 
Now what we want to do is we want to implement a runnable. And let's go through our includes real quick. We've got queue object, queue thread, queue runnable, queue debug, queue event loop, something which is new. This is a way of actually stopping a thread, but still handling event loops. We're going to demonstrate that here in a second, meaning we can pause that thread, or I should say lock it up, but at the same time still get signals and slots. It's actually very cool. We're going to use queue scope pointer because we want memory management and a queue timer. So we're going to implement our runnable. We're going to do that by just going here. Say we want to implement the public part of runnable. Right click runnable, go to refractor, and insert virtual functions of base class. If I went too fast, public, key runnable, right click this, refractor, insert virtual functions of base class. Then you want to make sure that we are going to implement run and hit OK. And it's going to add this little guy here. You can actually get rid of that if you don't want it. That way you don't have that ugly comment there. Now we're almost done with the header file here. We're going to say public slots. And we're going to say void work. Now we need to actually implement things. So I'm going to right click work, refractor, and add definition in our implementation file. You can see run is already in there for us in its, all of its glory. And let's go ahead and implement our deconstructor. So far, this is actually fairly simple. This class really isn't going to do a whole lot. But what we are going to do is print out some things on the screen. Again, the joys of working on the command line. It's very screen intensive. And here, I want to do something a little different. We're going to say Q underscore funk info. This little guy right here is awesome. It will print out on the screen all of the function info. Basically, it'll tell us the file, the line number, and all that fun stuff. So we know exactly where we are in our code. And then we're just going to say Q thread, current thread. Just print out whatever thread we're currently running on. The thing I love about using this QFunk info is we can now just copy and paste that everywhere and it tells us exactly where we are in our code. All right, quick recap. We have our constructor. We have our deconstructor. We just simply want to see when this is constructed, when it's deconstructed. We have run. Run is part of the runnable back here. And this is used specifically for thread pools, but we can call it directly. So we're going to do that. This is where the bulk of our work is going to happen. But before we do that, let's skip down to work. And this is where we would do something. I'm going to say do something cool here. We're not going to actually fill in that code, but just imagine like this would be interfacing with a hardware device or doing something. And then when we're done doing whatever we're doing, we're going to emit that finished slot. I should say finished signal. Sorry, I misspoke there. Now emit is a special keyword in Qt, which is saying, hey, go out to signal land and emit that. And then anything that's connected to it will say, oh, something happened. Finish was emitted and we need to use whatever slot is connected. All right, back up and run. This is where the heavy lifting is going to take place here. I'm going to grab this. And this is where we need to slow down a little bit for this section. What we're going to do is we're going to implement an event loop. Now this takes a little bit of explaining, so I'm going to explain as we go. I'm just going to say we are starting the loop. Now when we say a loop, we're not actually going to loop repetitively. This isn't like a for loop or a do loop. This is strictly inside of the event system inside of Qt. So we're going to say Q scoped pointer, meaning we're doing memory management now. And we're going to say Q event loop. There are don't get hung up on the details. There's a billion different ways of doing this. I'm just showing you what I call the lazy person's guide to doing this because I absolutely hate memory management. I would rather the computer do it for me. So all we're doing here is we're making a scoped pointer using an event loop. Now notice this is a scoped pointer. So when this function is done running, QScope pointer is going to automatically delete that for us. We are also going to make a timer. There's a few reasons why we're doing pointers here. Well, the first one is we are going to use this class in a thread. And if it is already existing, it simply won't work. You're going to get a cross thread operation. And what do I mean by that? 
if I go into the header and say something like this private queue timer, when I go to use this timer, it's not going to work if we've already created it on another thread. Because remember, the worker, the, the instance of this, would be created on the main thread and then we would move it to another thread. But when it's created, the timer would be created with it. So that is why when you're working with threads, you want to create things, pointers, as needed. That way they are created in the thread which they actually need to be running on. All right. Whew lot of explaining there sorry about that but anyways we have two scope pointers an event loop and a timer so the timer is going to well do what timers do which is a, a specific interval it's going to do something so i'm going to say timer dot set ah i am the victim of my own horrible spelling there we go timer dot set interval and we're going to set this to two seconds, which is an eternity in computer time. And now what we're going to do is we're going to do some connect code. And I hate typing connect code, so bear with me. There's probably not an easier way of doing this unless we do auto connections, which we'll cover later, but uh, it just is what it is for the time being. So we're gonna say queue timer, timeout. And in Qt's defense, this is probably way better than it used to be in older versions of Qt, so. So what we're doing here is we're saying when the timer fires off, the timeout is emitted, our class is going to call work. So every time this timer fires off, work is going to be called. Now, what is going on here? Timer data. Hmm. That's why. In case you're wondering what was going on, I was using the operator, this guy. And we're not working with a pointer. We're working with a local resource, the QScope pointer. Data points to the actual pointer, which is a pointer to the QTimer out on memory. If that's not blatantly confusing, I don't know what is. All right, so basically when the timer fires off, boom, we're gonna call this work function. Now we can just use this to copy and paste my favorite invention in the whole wide world. And we're gonna do some surgery here. We're gonna say this meaning this instance, and we're gonna say worker finished. So when the worker emits a finish down here in work, ta -da, right here, then we need to do something here. And this is where it gets a little bit confusing. What we're going to do is we're going to say this loop, Remember, we want the data to go to the actual pointer. Otherwise, it's going to be pointing to the QScope pointer. And we're going to say Q event loop quit, meaning we're going to tell the event loop, which we haven't really used yet, to quit. We're setting up our signals and slots. So we don't have to worry about it. It's just going to automatically work for us. All right, now we're going to go ahead and start our timer. Now you may be asking, wait a minute, that's a function and that's a slot. I can tell by the icons, what's the difference? Well, honestly, other than the signature, there's really no difference. You're calling it and it could be called as a slot or as a function, it really doesn't matter. Now we're going to use our event loop. So we're gonna say loop.exec. And what loop exec is going to do, is going to block our current thread. So let's highlight this in F1. And it says enters the main event loop and waits until exit is called, returns the value. Meaning this is now going to block. So whatever thread it's running on, it's going to come to a screeching halt and nothing else will get processed. We're doing this in this example because the timer is gonna be firing away asynchronously in the background. And it's going to do something cool like connect to a hardware device after two seconds. And then when it's done, it's going to emit finished. So we have to have this guy right here to tell the loop to quit. Otherwise, it's just going to block it forever. Now, as you can guess, blocking is very bad. So you don't want to do that on the main loop. Or I should say the main thread. Jeez, too many loops. You know what I meant. All right, now that we've got this, let's go ahead and give the class a good build. 
All right, now I realize this class is super, super confusing. Quick recap here. This is a queue object, so we can work with signals and slots. It's implementing runnable, so we have to have the run function. This is called in a thread pool, but we can also use it out of a thread pool just as a normal function or even as, well, however we want. Then we have a public slot called work. Inside of this worker, we're going to monitor the constructor, the deconstructor, and then we've implemented run. This is just going to start a loop and a timer. The timer is going to fire off every two seconds, but we're really only going to use that one time if you're paying attention here, because what's going to happen is when it emits finished, our class emits finished, our event loop is going to quit. So we're going to stop blocking. Speaking of the event loop, what this does, it basically runs a loop in the background and that loop really blocks our thread. You have to be very, very careful. And it says, generally speaking, no user interaction can take place before calling exec as a special case modal widgets like QMessageBox can be used calling exec. If that sounds very cryptic, like you don't know what I'm talking about, it's because we haven't covered any of it. But what it's really saying here is you have to be very careful using this because you're going to start blocking the execution of your application and bad things happen very, very quickly. All right, let's flip back into our main and we are going to just pop in some includes out of my notes. Don't know why I have it like that, but we're going to do it the correct way. All right, now that we've got that in there, we're going to, you guessed it, set up for the rest of this video, which is our thread, current thread. We're gonna set that object name to the main thread. And then we're going to just say, hey, we're finished. And then in the coming sections, we're going to go over the different ways of doing it. So at a very high level, all we have so far is, well, nothing. We just have a class. It's, we're going to be able to work with threads. And if you run it at this point, it's just going to say it's finished on the main thread. The major takeaway here is what we're going to do is take this worker class and bounce it around the different thread strategies and see how it acts. All right, to start off with, let's run this in the main thread. You may be going, now wait a minute, I thought this was a video on threading. Yes, I'm going to show you what people do wrong. That way you can avoid doing it yourself because trust me, I've done it many, many times. First thing we're gonna do here is we're gonna make a function called test main. And in here, we're just gonna slap in, hey, we're gonna be testing this in our main. And we're gonna plop it between here so we can see it actually run. All right, back up here. Let's go ahead and get this going. I'm gonna say worker, and let's call this worker. Notice right off the bat what we're doing here. We have a pointer, and well, I need the new keyword for it to actually be a pointer. This means we have some memory management we have to deal with. Otherwise, we're going to have a memory leak. And you can see, yep, now I was kind of waiting on the IDE to catch up. Yep, it's saying, you know, potential memory leak, blah, blah, blah. So we are now in memory land and we have to be very mindful of that. And we're gonna say worker. And we're just gonna call run. You may be going, now isn't run part of Q runnable? It is, but we can still call it directly because it's just simply a function. And then worker dot delete later. There's a bunch of different ways you could have done this. You could have just deleted it directly. But we're going to tell Q to garbage collect that by using the delete later function. And let's go ahead and say Q info. Horrible spelling today. Don't know why. Maybe I need more coffee. That's usually the answer here. All right, let's go ahead, save and run and see this thing in action. Now remember, this is running on our main thread. All right, so what we've got here, testing on main our worker with its memory address. You can see there's the constructor running on main thread. Then we have our worker run running on the main thread. This is bad because remember that little event loops running in the background and that will have a ripple effect through our application because everything is running in the main thread and it will lock that up. So if you see here, it says, Work is called on the main thread and then finished and then testing finished, blah, blah, blah. And then our deconstructor is finally called, meaning that was garbage collected. But let me really demonstrate what I mean here. 
Let's set this out to some astronomical value. Yikes, that's a long time to wait. So we're going to save and let's rerun this and see this. Now you can see what I mean here. It's starting, but nothing else has happened because that event loop has locked up our main thread. And if we wanted to wait that full minute, then you'd see everything pop out. But let's go ahead and close that and let's dial that time back to five seconds. Five seconds, I, even when I'm recording, I feel like that's an eternity. But we're just going to sit here for five seconds. So how are you doing? I'm doing fairly well. Ah, there it goes. You see what I mean, though? This is all running on the main thread, and we blocked the execution of that main thread, meaning our entire application came to a screeching halt until that timer fired off. So you got to be a little bit careful when using the main thread to run your code. Major, major takeaway here is if you're going to run on the main thread, don't do anything processor intensive or that's going to really lock up your application like using a queue event loop. But you notice even though we were blocking it, because we're using the queue event loop, we can still get the signals and slots. Point in case when the timer fired off after five seconds, it emitted finished. And because we had that connected via signals and slots, we were able to, you guessed it, quit that event loop. Now that we understand those concepts, we're going to move much, much faster through this video because honestly, you can go back and rewatch the videos where we talked about these concepts. So I'm going to say void. We're going to say test thread. And as the name would allude to, we are going to run this on a thread. So let's go down here and comment out test main. And this is where copy and paste becomes my best friend in the whole wide world. So what we're going to do here is we are going to plop in some code. And if copy and paste ever betrays you like this, you can simply highlight, right click, and then auto indent selection or hit whatever the command key is to do that. So we're gonna say Q thread, we're gonna make a new thread and we're going to set that object name to worker thread and then we're going to say testing on the worker thread and then our worker is going to be a new worker here. So what are we doing? Well, we're creating a whole bunch of pointers. The major takeaway here is we're going to say worker dot move to thread. You may be asking yourself, why are you making a pointer to queue thread? Well, look at where it is. It's inside of a function. So if we were to just make this on the stack, AKA not a pointer, as soon as this goes out of scope, it's going to kill that thread altogether. It's going to say, you know, try to execute on a thread that was destroyed. So you're gonna have a very bad time very, very quickly. So we're going to move to thread. And we're going to move it to the thread that we created. Again, the major thing is we're saying whatever object we want, move to thread. One thing we're not going to cover is actually using inheritance inside of a thread. I don't do that because I've seen people make some custom thread class and then wonder why their application blows up later. So don't do that. Use move to thread, which is the way it was intended. All right. So. From here, we're just going to copy and paste a whole boatload of connections. And if you're lazy like me, you can format it manually. There we go. So we've got connect and we're connecting our thread started to our worker run. So we're just calling that run function basically. We're saying worker, when it's finished, the worker is going to call delete later. Wait, what? So that means the worker is going to queue itself up with cute saying hey go ahead and delete me later i'm not needed anymore we're going to do the same thing with the thread when the thread says hey i'm finished we're going to delete later meaning we're queuing those up for garbage collection all right now our worker when it's finished we're going to say thread quit notice there's an order i'm doing this it doesn't matter with the connection code because the events in which they're emitted or i should say the um, order in which they're emitted is really going to define this but i put it on the screen in this order the worker is going to run. When the worker's finished, it's going to say, hey, cute, delete me later. Now, when the worker's finished, it's going to say the thread needs to quit, which is going to tell the thread internally to go ahead and shut down. The thread eventually is going to emit a finished, and then we're telling, hey, when the thread's finished, go ahead and queue that up for garbage collection as well. This is what I mean by, you know, connection code can get very cumbersome, not just in typing it, but just figuring out what in the heck is going on here. So 
This is something I absolutely love and hate about Qt is that it can get very verbose very quickly. But once you get it down, it's just amazing. So, so we're going to go ahead and start that thread. And then I'm just going to say Q info. So what are the pros and cons of this before we actually run this? Well, the pros are it's now going to be threaded. It's not going to run in the main. Uh, running in main had no pros and all the cons. But now that we're in a thread by using the move to thread, it will be a truly multi-threaded application. But you can see the complexity just shot up through the roof. We have all these connections we need to figure out. We need to make sure that we move to thread and then we have to start the thread. And on top of that, we have all this memory management we now have to keep track of, like delete later. But now it is truly multi-threaded and it should run with no problems. So let's just watch it as it goes. And boom, it's done. The main takeaway here is, okay, the worker was created in the main thread. And then you see tested and finished in the main thread, meaning the main thread's now done. Main thread's off doing other things while now our worker is happily running on our worker thread. And all of the work is being done on the worker thread. Pay special attention to which thread it's actually on. Now, at the very end here, you're going to say the worker did the work, the worker's finished, and then finally the deconstructor's called, meaning everything worked exactly the way we wanted it to. This is good, but it's not great. Remember, we made this as a queue runnable so we can work with a thread pool. Now, in the last section, at the very end, we touched on how this is a queue runnable. Now, what does that really get us here? It means we don't have to worry about all the complexity of threading. We're going to tell Qt to do it for us. That has a price tag, though, as you're about to see. So I'm going to say void test pool. And let's just go ahead and comment this out. And we're going to go ahead and run that on our thread pool. So. What do I mean by it has a price tag to it? Well, let's look at the pros and cons as I'm typing this out. And unfortunately, I can't really type and talk at the same time, so bear with me here. But basically, the thread pool has a pool of threads, which we can use, but it's limited in the number of threads that will run concurrently because your computer is limited. So that's one of the cons. But the pro is it has a much more elegant memory design, and it's much, much more efficient. So we get that. We also have this little guy here, set auto delete meaning we can tell the thread pool to deal with the memory management for us we also don't have to screw around with all those signals and slots anymore because we're going to say hey q thread pool go ahead and you can either make your own thread pool or you can make a global instance or i should say access the global instance and we're going to just go ahead and throw this runnable out there. Say, hey, you go deal with this q i've got other things to do i've got coffee to drink and i've got youtube videos to watch so this looks on the surface amazing because our complexity just went way down, but we've gained the, the awesomeness that is multi-threading. Now, what do you think is going to happen here? Do you think this is going to run perfectly? No. Remember, there is a con, and we're about to see what that con is. We're going to run this really, really fast. No pun intended because it's a threaded application. All right, so you can see right off the bat here, main thread. Boom, worker was created on the main thread. Testing finished, main thread now thinks it's done. The worker was run on the threaded pool. This is the thread inside the thread pool. And then it's starting on the thread pool, and then it's working on the main thread, and then, wait, what? Did you catch that? Worker work is running on the main thread, even though this is running in a thread pool. What? What the heck is going on here? So to finish this up, it's finishing on the thread pool, and then it's deconstructing on the thread pool. But why is work being called on the main thread? Oh, this is one of the complexities of multi-threading. So let's jump into our worker and figure out what's going on. So looking at this, what is actually calling this? Well, our timer set interval. So when that timer fires off, timer, timeout, it's calling work. Remember, the timer is asynchronous, not actually threaded. So the timer is going to do that wherever Qt's going to tell it to do it. And in this case, Qt is telling it to fire that off on the main thread. But this is the thing that's going to be doing all the number crunching. 
that we don't want to lock our application up for. So this is where you have to really dive into the documentation and understand the connection type. By default, it's the auto connection type. If you're going cross thread, you want a queued connection, which is what auto connection is supposed to do. In this case, auto connection is betraying us. We want a direct connection. And feel free to just highlight that and jump into the documentation. Direct connection, the slot is invoked immediately when the signal is emitted. The slot is executed in the signaling thread, meaning we're not going to jump bounce back and forth between threads. Where a queued connection, well, this would return control of the event loop. The slot is executed in the receiver's thread. So we want it in the same thread, so we want the direct connection. Let's try that again and see if it actually works this time. And when it times out, bang, there we go. Now you can see that worker work is actually doing it on the thread in the pool, not on the main thread. This is what I mean by you gotta be a little bit careful when you think that you know thread pool is gonna solve all your problems because it will do some weird things in the background. Just bear in mind that if you're going to start working with you know, pointers out in your run function, you're going to wanna make sure that those signals and slots are firing off in the same thread. Yes, you may have actually wondered, now wait a minute, does that mean the event loop is running on the main thread? Yes, it is. You have to be very careful with this. So just to kind of proof of concept here, let's just flip both of these over to direct connection just to make sure this still works as advertised. And when it times out, bang. Now everything works the way you would expect it to work. So our worker is created in the main thread, our main thread is done and it thinks it's ready to go off and do other things. And all of the actual work is now truly being done on the thread pool. All right, we've covered a lot of things so far here. We've covered running in main, bad idea. We've covered running in a thread, which is, well, good because it makes us multi-threaded, but it's bad because there's a lot of things we have to type. Uh, thread pools are awesome, but of course, now you have to deal with all these weird memory issues. What we're going to cover now is Qt Concurrent. Now remember, this is a high-level API, one API to rule them all, but it does all the threading for us. And to that end, we have to treat it a little bit differently here. We can't just call test concurrent directly like this, because then what are we doing? We're really running this in the main thread. So what we need to do here is say Qt concurrent run and then tell it what function to actually run. If you can't get to that point, remember you need your include and in your CMake list, you also have to include concurrent and it has to have all of that in there or it just won't work. And when we're running, it's basically going to take this entire function, wrap it inside a runnable and throw it out on a thread pool. At least that's how I imagine it happens under the hood. I honestly don't know for sure. But logic would say that's how it's working. One of these days I'm going to get out to the source code and check it out just to make sure I'm saying that accurately because that's the awesome thing about Qt is you can look at the source code. And in case you're wondering, just go out to Google and type in Qt source code and there it is. All right, so we're going to call this worker. Ah, if I can spell worker. Uh, you'll notice right off the bat this is a scope pointer, meaning, wait a minute, as soon as this goes out of scope, it's going to delete this. That's absolutely right. This is what I mean by you have to treat this a little bit differently. Now we can use smart pointers and use a multi-threaded design and a thread pool all combined into one and we don't have to worry about any of the things. But because this is working at a higher level, we also lose what's called granularity, meaning we can't really control all the nitty gritty of things. We just trust Qt to make it happen. And let's go ahead and say testing. All right, so this is much, much simpler compared to the other designs. The big takeaway here is, well, this entire function will be run on a thread, and now we can work with scope directly. We don't have to worry about delete later and all that other fun stuff. Let's go ahead and run this using Qt concurrent run and see what happens here. And after five seconds, bang. There we go. So main thread and then testing and then our workers made on the thread pooled. This is Qt concurrent throwing it out on a thread pool. 
workers running on the thread pool, starting on the thread pool, work is done on the thread pool, finished on the thread pool, and then you see where it says testing. And then finally, our workers deconstructed. You notice the difference there. It's not deconstructed and then testing or any other thing. It's It gets to the end here, and then when it goes out of scope, that scope pointer deletes this automatically for us. All right, so quick recap here. We've got run on main, run in a thread, pool, and queue concurrent. Which one is right? Which one is the best? Well, there really isn't a best. That's why all of these methods exist. However, I tend to lean towards using queue concurrent because as you can see, compared to the others, it takes a lot of the complexity and guesswork out of this. It's simply very elegant and very easy to use. All right, as promised, we're going to look at a very simple, simple widgets example, because all we've been doing so far is on the command line. But understand there's a reason why. When you're looking at the command line, you're like, whoopee doo, it's a threaded application. It all looks the same. But if we go to new project and say cute widgets, you're going to notice all these other things. And don't worry, we're going to cover these in future videos. So don't get overwhelmed with questions. But we're going to say cute widgets. And then let's just call this test CMake. You notice how it's not much different. Until you get to this screen, there's a main window, a widget, and a dialog. I'm just going to make it as a dialog so it's much simpler. It's going to give us a header, a source file, a form file, which is actually just XML under the hood, and we want to generate that form. And then the rest is pretty much the same. And let's look at the structure of this real quick here. So you can see how we have headers, we have source files, and then we have this dialog.ui. Now in our main, we have a queue application and a dialog.w, dialog show. What is going on here? Well, basically it's making an instance of this dialog, which here's the code underneath it. Don't get super confused, we're gonna go into this. And it's basically building up a copy of this XML file. I know this doesn't look like XML because this is the interface editor or I should say the what you see is what you get editor. And what we can do here is we can just drag and drop visual elements. Like I can say, I want that button on here, right? And we can do things like, you know, I want it to look like this. And if I'm whipping through this and you're going, now wait, what are you doing? I'm gonna cover all this in future videos, but I wanna ask you, and please leave me some feedback in the comments below. Do you want me to ditch the command line and start working with widgets? Or do you want me to continue on the command line and then once we've covered like networking and other things, go over to widgets? Just drop a comment below. But everything that I'm covering, and I, I hate shameless advertising, so forgive me, but it's out on Udemy under the, where is it? Q5 widgets for beginners covers way, way, way more than you'd ever want to know about widgets just for starting off. But all we've done is we've dragged and dropped a button in here. Now, if we close this, I want to show you here it opens it back up and it puts it all just beautifully. If I go to edit, you can see the XML properties under here. We're making a Q push button and then we can do things with it. So we're gonna go back into our dialog, highlight our button, and then we're going to go to slot down here. And then we're gonna say when the button is clicked, hit okay. And then we can do things with it. And it's actually really, really cool. And you notice how what's going on here is it's adding it in to our dialog. So I'm going to say include QThread. And I'm going to show you why threading is super important in a user interface application here. Because let's just say we were to do something user, or I should say work intensive here. I'm going to do something like this. QThread, current thread. MS sleep, and we're gonna put this to sleep for a very, very long time, one minute. That's an eternity. That's like the entire existence of the universe and all the things in computer time here. But let's flip back to our main real quick. I just wanna demonstrate something here. So what's going on here is, you guessed it, the dialogue is running in our main thread. And to really solidify that in your mind, we're gonna do this. This is the one thing that I really don't like about widgets programming is, well, 
all of your user interface runs in, you guessed it, the main thread. Oh, that is not good, right? So let's go back in here and we're just gonna print that out. Now again, don't get caught up in the complexity of what is all of this stuff and pretty please explain all this. We're gonna to get to it, just not in this video. Again, leave a comment below whether you want me to ditch the command line and go into widgets programming, or if you just enjoy the command line. So what we're gonna do now is I'm going to demonstrate why threading is super important to understand before you even attempt user interfaces. So we're gonna say qinfo, and we wanna know the qthread, current thread. And then whatever the current thread is, we're gonna put it to sleep for a very long time. Save and run. Now this, I'm going to warn you, is going to act very different on different machines. And you see I have this terminal in the background. You can get rid of this by choosing projects and how it's running. We'll cover that in a different video. But if I click this, you see it's running in the main thread and now our, our program, we can't do anything. I can't even close this, it's hung up. See what I mean? It's like, uh, dialog not responding, force quit. I'm sure you've seen applications do that before. So what we've done is we've just completely hung up our main thread and effectively killed our application. Not cool. But that's the biggest reason right there why you want to really master threading before you move on to other topics. I hope you enjoyed this video. You can find the source code out on github.com. If you need additional help, myself and thousands of other developers are hanging out in the Void Realms Facebook group. This is a large group with lots of developers and we talk about everything technology related, not just the technology that you just watched. And if you want official training, I do develop courses out on udemy.com. This is official classroom style training. If you go out there and the course you're looking for is just simply not there, drop me a note. I'm either working on it or I will actually develop it. I will put a link down below for all three of those. And as always, Help me help you smash that like and subscribe button. The more popular these videos become, the more I'll create and publish out on YouTube. Thank you for watching.